We are back on another round of reviewing the professional coach. This email was sent out on September 5th and it is, the title is a protein primer and how to use your floor space. And uh, I don't think we could have any better person discuss optimizing floor space than uh, who we've got on the call with us today, who is actually the, uh, the author of the article. And that is Mr. Adam Fuller, owner of CrossFit Thin Air and uh, CrossFit Level 4 trainer, man. Welcome to the, uh, to the discussion here. Stoked to have you on. Um, and why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself as far as uh, why you were the one that got asked to, to respond to this question. Um, yeah, I, I had been reading the professional, uh, the articles and the emails that come through and, um, you know, yeah, I own a 400 square foot garage affiliate and, uh, we're tucked away in the, the mountain town of, you know, maybe two, 3000 people. So it's a smaller community for us and, and having this garage gym, uh, has been so fun for us to have. And when I saw people talking about, you know, space and, equipment and programming and um, just the daily struggles of, that we go through to like, how are we going to navigate this many people? Uh, like you see in the pictures, like, you know, this is part of our class and there's some even still down in the driveway from this, but on a nice summer day, we can spill out. But in the winter, we still pack 12 people in here, but it, we do it differently. Um, but we keep some of the main things in mind um, that we all learn from the loved one level two. Been yeah. fun. That's that's awesome, man. Yeah, I would definitely say that that running a 400 square foot garage affiliate, it, you're definitely the man to ask answer the question. The question is, my classes are getting crowded. Should I move locations or cap classes? Um, so yeah, learning how to be efficient with space, as we can see in the picture here, is a, is a huge part of it. Um, Kristen, have you had to deal with limited space? I know you you guys, the affiliate that you coach at, you guys have had a couple different locations. Have you had yeah. to deal with that at all? Yeah, our main uh, our main space is pretty pretty good as far as exactly what you would want. It's a nice big open like square slash rectangle. But our we have a couple other spaces that are much smaller, and our newest location actually has a little bit of an um, kind of a different shape to it as well. So certainly have to be a little creative with the class management plan to be able to fit barbells and people. And so I loved reading through this and, and seeing how Adam and his coaching staff deal with even smaller of a space in a garage. It's really cool. Now you make mention on the first tip of mix it up and clean it up. And in really this discussion is optimizing your space and really looking closely at what equipment you have, where it's located and how you're going to lay things out. What were some of the considerations that you had going into this, Adam? Obviously we can see a picture here on the screen of like the pull-up bars pretty darn close to the, to the, to the wall space, the racks with the dumbbells, all of that. What were some of the considerations that you had as you were putting, putting together your garage affiliate? Yeah, the biggest thing for us is, is floor space. You know, we can, if we have barbells out, we got we have to maximize the amount of space in there. So, um, you know, as we look at our space and you scale it up to like 2,000 square feet, it's all about percentages. And so, if I can gain 10% back by moving this dumbbell rack that you see there, it used to be on the opposite corner. You know, it bumped out, and so it narrowed our space down a little bit more. And then when I moved it, it tucked in behind um, the stairs, so you can still access the dumbbells. But that space now above it has the TV, has the whiteboard, has the fans. And it's just, it was an unusable corner for us. And so when I look at, you know, mixed up, cleaned it up, is you know, if I move this dumbbell rack from one space to the next, I just gained two feet off the wall and 10 feet of a spread. And so that's a good square footage that we gain, which for me is one more safely using barbell in that corner. And so when we've done that, everything has, okay, well, what if we move this thing, you know, even those like pull-up bars you see there, okay, they come in, you know, 18 inch, 24 inch, you know, big ones. And as close as I can get to the wall, that's more floor space. And then mm -hmm. we have found a company that does like those fly bars. Where you can do pull-ups still way out the top uh, and not kick the wall. So um, yeah, every inch mattered and it's 
fun to just kind of look at the space and go, like, oh, what if we, you know, what if we just move the trash can over a little bit? Um, and the next thing you know, trash can is now hidden under the stairs and people can still access it, but it's not, it's no longer in the way. So um, it was fun. It's fun to just. This is a cool concept too, no matter how, what size your gym is. You know, I can't yeah. tell you how many spaces I've been to that if you take, if you just close your eyes and imagine not one piece of equipment in there, it's a beautiful, large, spacious area, but just the way that everything's arranged really prevents it from being the best use of space. And I think a lot of coaches and gym owners have had their space, maybe the way that it's been always. And never really take it. And then, of course, as we know, it's just like our houses, right? Over the years, we just get more and we get more and we get more and never really taken that chance to, or the opportunity, I guess, like you were saying, Adam, just look around and be like, where are my dead zones? Does it really make sense to have this year? So and, and, and that's what I, I like the most was the, the fact that you are continually evaluating and changing things. It's like you had limited space to begin with. So I'm sure it was pretty optimized, all things considered. But to look back and be like, all right, cool, we've now grown. We've got more people coming to class. How can I inch out another location for a barbell and things like that? And I think to Kristen's point, like I've seen a lot of gyms where it's like as a big space with very few members, you look at it and you're like, you know what? I think the rig right in the middle of the floor will be awesome. That'll give me room on either side and we can make this happen. And that's great when you have, you know, a handful of members. But as the membership grows, that might not no longer be the optimal solution for where your equipment goes and, and being willing to look at it and reassess and maybe move some things around, I think is a big piece um, for people that even have significantly bigger spaces, obviously, than yours, Adam, um, and not just thinking, well, this is where it's always been. So this is where it's always going to be. And if it doesn't fit with this, then I guess I need a new space. It's like, no, no, you need to reorganize your space potentially and figure out ways to uh to optimize that and see how you could create a better flow or just more floor space. Um, yeah. So I, I love think, the, uh, the last sentence up there is, you know, is the paying one more paying member, uh, the additional revenue worth more than the space occupied by a dusty yoke. It's like every gym has that yeah. one piece of equipment. It's like, do, are we really using this? It's taking yeah. up so much space. Yeah. You just got to cut the ties. Yeah, every, <laughs> yeah. Everything has a purpose. I mean, I, I have books on the wall for like crossover symmetry stuff, but those bands don't live on the wall because the, that wall is a handstand push up wall. It's a yes. wall wall wall. It's a wall ball wall. Like, and so I have, you know, it's fun for me to do my shoulder stuff. And, you know, if someone comes in and they want to work on it, great, but I've got to pull that out of the bin and, you know, reorganize that. But, yeah, floor space, wall space, everything is critical. And if it doesn't serve a purpose to the masses, mm -hmm. uh, I love having sandbags and I love having fun toys. I have a sled, but that stuff doesn't get to live inside and because uh, it doesn't, I don't have 12 of them. So. I, I, think that's, I think, think that's such a good point too. And that's kind of always been a rule of mine is like, if I can't buy five of them, like, I think five is the minimum I can use to actually program that piece of equipment in class. Like I could do it fight gone bad style or something like that. But if I have less than five, then I'll never program it in class. And if I can't program it in class, it's probably just going to be wasting space. So the ideas of the yokes, some of the sandbag stones, things like that, where I'm like, yeah, this would be cool as a one off. And so many gyms, especially in the early days when there wasn't as much equipment available, where you kind of homemade a lot of your equipment, it's like, I'm sure, Kristen, you've done the same thing where you go into gyms where you're teaching seminars and you're like, look at that one thing over there in the corner that has so much dust. It's clearly it's never so been used. Dust. It's still there. It's like, holy crap, what are we doing with all this stuff? I know it maybe has a, a place in your heart because of what it meant to you at the time, but get rid of that crap. Move on <laughs> yeah. and try something different. Um, I think another good point that you make, tip number two, evaluating your programming and taking a look at what the workout looks like. And, and realizing that the workout itself isn't the main takeaway and the most important part. It's like, hey, what are we trying to achieve with this workout? What's the stimulus? And how can we do that in an optimized way and uh, to alleviate some of the pressures of additional floor space being needed? Um, so I think it's a cool idea of, of bar hops instead of double unders. What are some of the other things you guys do programming wise um, when it comes to trying to make room in, in your affiliate? Um, the jump rope is a big one. I mean, it's we, we love double unders. It's fun to do, you know, summertime, we bring the ropes out a lot because we can spread out outside a little bit more. Um, but plate, plate hops, 
you know, jumping over the bar. Um, I, you know, we have rowers, we have bikes, but if the workout needs more space, guess what? A burpee today is going to take up, hmm. you know, way less space than a rower will. Yep. Uh, so switching the, what's the modality, what's the feel, what's the feel of the thing and how can I recreate that as well as I can with the least amount of space. So I bet um, your people are dumb- still getting fit too. Oh yeah. Yeah. Watching the progression of like, Hey, we haven't front squatted in a while. Great. Well, today's a heavy front squat day. And they're like, oh, I PR'd by a bunch. Why is that? Like, well, we can, we can talk more about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, it has to do with your new to training and you're doing it consistently and that works. Yeah. Yeah. And you didn't have to front squat to get good at front squats. So, exactly. You know, exactly. a lot of dumbbells um, when we need it. And then, you know, we bought uh, short bars. Rogue has those little C60s. Cool. And so yeah. you can kind of pack those in. But when it comes to programming, you know, partner stuff. Um, the other, was it yesterday we had um, we had ring dips and overhead squats. And so, um, hey, partner one, grab a partner, whoever, you know, is going to share a bar. Um, partner one's on the bar, partner two's on the rings. If you catch the other one, you become their cheerleader for the next five seconds, and they're going to be off. And then, you know, we're still got that. seven, eight, nine rounds. Um, fitness still happened. I think it was it's not sure whether it says fitness achieved, right? Fitness um, was just, achieved, yep. I love fitness that. was achieved, and, and my arm's still blown up, and my hurts put my hands over my head so sometimes it's uh, worse when I, you have to share something and have a yeah. little bit of rest <laughs> you or, go or push, yeah pushes you to go faster than you want to because you want to stay ahead of that person or you're trying to catch somebody do you guys ever end up like switching the the workout just for one specific class like hey this class is my busy class and so we're going to do burpees instead of rowing but the rest of the day because the class is a little bit smaller uh we'll we'll stick with our rowing that was originally programmed does that happen very often I think the way our classes run so one after the next that the 6 a.m. one is our biggest one. So that one has like the most accommodations. And then by the time we get to 8.15, um, there's a lot more elbow room. So it's like, all right, actually, let's go ahead and do this today. Uh, but usually it's pre-programmed for what that might be. Um, we might get a little bit less sharing at the 8.15 class. So we kind of start everyone at the same spot, which is also fun. Um, but in the article, I talk about like partner grace. That's like when you have to do five reps unbroken, and that you go five, I go five, you go five, I go five. And that's a terrible way to do a six minute. Devastating. Round. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so. the, exactly. Exactly. You say that right here is like, hey, we do fight on bad um, schemes that allow athletes to rotate movements easily, or one alternative is grace. Uh, for grace is to partner up for a six minute AMRAP, switching every five reps with a partner. Each partner must perform five touch and go reps. I can tell you right now that if you're having me do five reps touch and go for all of the workout, that is more than I would do if I was doing this thing solo. It'd right. be like one set of five at the beginning and then it'd be singles the rest of the way as I'm like hook gripping my shorts. Um, so it's going to elicit more intensity, which is, which is, which is amazing. Um, and it's it, like you said, it's like, it makes it fun. It gives you a different spin. And I think sometimes people get so caught up on the fact that like, well, the workout was written like this and the later classes are going to do it like this. Everybody wants to do it that way. We need to keep doing it that way. And it's like, does it really matter? Like, did you come in? Did you sweat? Did you get a good workout in? It doesn't matter if the scoreboard doesn't exactly line up. I don't think that's the biggest takeaway. Um, and, and not only should you be willing to be flexible enough to switch some of that stuff up, but also create a culture in your gym to where people don't care that much. Did we do a slightly different version of this than the later classes did? Who cares? No big deal. It doesn't yeah. really matter. Right. And even when we're like stagger starting, you know, if you, if you end on the row and you get less calories and if someone ends on, you know, a faster movement, you only get one calorie. And so it's like, oh man, so-and-so got this score and I didn't beat him today and I usually do and it's like well they started somewhere else but get them tomorrow you know and yeah. it's it's all going to come out in the wash when it comes to the fitness side of it and, um yeah and it seems like I don't know if my members some of them leaderboard at the end of the day and just check on each other and just rally each other which is it's so fun that they do that but I think some people just like you know, they say their score at the end of the day and then they don't really think about it. And then, hey, what did you get yesterday? Oh, I got this. Oh, cool. Good job. You know? Uh, so it's helpful. Yeah. I I mean, it's a fun part of it and it's an important part, right? Recording our scores and competing with somebody and talking a little bit of trash is great, but it shouldn't be the priority. It shouldn't be the, the, the main thing that we're focused on in the gym. And if it sounds like the culture that you've created, uh, 
is to get the fitness in and not necessarily worry about the scores as the top priority, then it ends up working out. Um, I know another thing that I did when we moved into our first space and we had very limited, not, not 400 square foot, um, but we had days where like Mondays were always our busiest days. And so I would purposefully change the programming around to where it's like, all right, this is the day where we have the most people. So I've got the limited, like, I'm going to have to limit my space and the workout's going to have to adjust accordingly. And then like Thursdays when the days were mm -hmm. typically a little bit lighter attended, I could change the programming to, to use a little bit more equipment and hopefully not have to partner people up or do any of that kind of stuff. Do you ever end up doing that, Adam? Yeah, absolutely. Tuesdays are is our biggest one, um, and on those days, you know, we'll we'll plan a heavy day because heavy days are so time. Like, hey, you're gonna go at the zero, you're gonna go at the one, you're gonna go at the two, and then we're gonna cycle back through, and we can get twelve people on three squat rack or four squat racks, and so pretty easily, you know, we can still get those heavy days in. Um, so that may be Tuesday where we front load that, and we know Friday's kind of our slowest day and so friday we're gonna be like great we're overhead squatting we got the big bars out we got this um and we you know we use cap and then i take the whole seven days and pick and choose and delete of it and i also look at cap and be like this is not gonna work in our gym so right we gotta come up with a new, new plan on that one so um, yeah it's interesting I think, yeah like just it, it's this weird like giving yourself permission that it's your gym. You can change it according to what your members need. And I think sometimes, you know, coaches or um, the owners, it's like, okay, I'm, this is the program that we're following. And if we change it at all, then we're not following the program. It's like, that's not the case. Like do what or you, you won't need get to do to make it. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do what you no. need to do to make it work for your people. I think tip number four is huge too, is like, obviously our job is to coach people. And so making sure that we can adjust the layouts to be in a position to most optimally see and correct and coach and get around to each of our athletes. Um, Kristen, I'm sure this is something you've had to deal with, like teaching level twos where you walk into a gym you've never been before. You're expected to coach a class of athletes you've never experienced before, sometimes more athletes, sometimes less. Have you had to deal with this situation at different gyms where the, the space is limited or we've got a ton of participants and, and how do you navigate that? Oh yeah. All, all the time. Right. And the challenge with that is you, sometimes don't even know what you're going to get right until you walk in the door, but it's the same, like, you know, sometimes you change the workout a little bit from what you had planned. Uh, but the main thing that I do is just visualize, like I imagine, okay, where am I, where I'm going to set everybody up? Where am I going to, what's my main kind of home base going to be where I coach from and just getting an idea and a feel for the floor space so that again, that, that is going to allow me to get the most bang for my buck as far as seeing, keeping everybody safe and just making sure that you're using the space that you have as effectively as you can use it. Adam, it, it looks like you've switched or like adjusted where you actually coach from in your gym. I know looking at some of the coaches development homework videos from some of your other coaches, they coach from one side. I know you made mention on a call a couple of weeks ago or maybe last week of like, hey, I got called out for getting stuck in a corner. Like, what have you done to adjust kind of where you set people up and does that change from day to day and how do you make that work? Yeah, we definitely have a layout that we will follow. If there's, if there's a barbell, they go this way because I can fit more of them in there with more buffer. You know, if we're doing burpees, they go this way, you know. So there's the cookie cut, you know, if we have boxes, they go here. So we have that layout. Um, but one thing since, yeah, I, I definitely got, I got just kept getting stuck um kind of right behind me where i'm standing and um Lindsay was like get out of that corner and uh <laughs> so the other day i like i had to change the bars and so i had a walking path um, yeah so i wasn't having to worry about coaching from one spot so i tried to set it up so i could see better but i definitely have like okay, i'm gonna demo here and then all right go ahead and grab your bar and move here coach from this side and move here so um even in this picture here you know this is one way that we'll face people and then you know, depending on what the workout is, we may face them in because I can see from one side more bar paths or, you know, where where's the safest place for my members to move and how can I move safely uh, with that. So, yeah, layouts, you know, oftentimes we'll write the workout and we'll come out and be like, hmm, this is not, I'm not sure where I'm going to stand for this one. So um, it's always something our coaches will, 
they'll either deviate to where they saw the previous coach stand or maybe they have or, or away if they didn't if they saw that it wasn't effective. Yeah. Yeah. Like I've I've done that too, where it's like I come and either watch a class or I take a class and I'm like, that flow sucked. I'm, I'm gonna <laughs> change it when I coach the later class. Um, and I think it kind of goes back to the same thing we talked about earlier of like not feeling committed to the way the equipment's set up, also not feeling committed to where like this is the layout of the gym and this is where they're always facing and where everybody's always set up. And I also think to that point, being very deliberate on where you have people set up and being in control and in charge of that. I've also been to gyms where people are like, the coaches are like, all right, guys, grab your box, grab your barbell, find some floor space. And it's like, they do it however you want to. And you've got some people facing this way. Some people are facing this way. There's boxes, there's kettle. And you're like, this just, you know, makes your skin cur like crawl if you are in the class and not a coach. Um, so being deliberate on any and all of that kind of stuff, I think is, yeah. is huge and, and, a, and a great tip to take away. I think the, the final of, stuff that, oh, go ahead. I was going to say a piece of our whiteboard brief even is, you know, all right, here's the workout. This is how I want you to arrange the bar. So they're starting to think about that even from minute zero to three, they're saying, okay, I see how the flow of this is going to go. That way, when it's grab a bar, they're like, he said to do this. This is the flow of this. This is how I'm going to trade out with my partner. This is my box. This is where my bar will go. Here's my partner, and here's how we'll interact with this, too. Um, Some self-sufficient so like, athletes. Yeah. And that's yeah. next building, level building stuff. That's great. Right, right mm -hmm. away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that only happens in the whiteboard brief. If you've taken the time in your lesson planning to think through that and organize that and kind of play with that in your mind. So it's like that pre-work yeah. that you're doing beforehand is what sets all of this up for success, mm -hmm. allows you to communicate it to people. They do it. And then it's, then it's more of a natural flow and things are organized. I think some of these additional things that you put in here, and I've seen this in some of your videos, we have a variety of PVC lengths. I see like the front squats and the shoulder presses, the PVC is like, <laughs> you know, that big, just enough to get their hands yeah, around. You don't like, this, is, this is so <laughs> badass. Like it doesn't have to be the length of a entire barbell or, or longer or whatever. Um, and you already made mention of the rogue C60 bars and all that kind of stuff. So it's like, get as creative as you can. Um, most of the time there is more space in your gym than you think. And so if you're a gym owner that's contemplating capping classes or finding a new location, I would argue that a new location is probably going to come with a higher price tag in that unless you've gone through all of these different steps, looked at changing your equipment or your layout, looked at ways that you can play with your programming, or maybe even like you mentioned at the beginning of this call where you've added an additional class time to the end of the day, those are all things that we should consider and, and, and try to do before worrying about finding a new location or finding more space. So um, really, really cool, Adam. Appreciate you sharing all that stuff. This was a great article. And uh, hopefully look forward to seeing some more articles from you in the, in the uh, professional coach, man. If you're a coach looking to get bite-sized daily tips on how to run better classes inside the affiliate facilitated by some of the best coaches in the world inside of the CrossFit space, check out the knowledge. Everything that you're looking for is in there. How to run classes, how to correct athletes, how to know some of the conceptual things with inside of this whole CrossFit space. Check it out. Run better classes. Check out the knowledge.